Okay, everyone. Well, this is the moment you've all been waiting for. We've been counting down our top 100 books for several weeks now, doing them 25 or so at a time, 100 to 75, 75 to 50, 50 to 25. All of those videos are already recorded and up and live, ready for your book loving consumption. And today what we're going to do is we're going to look at 25 all the way down to my number one book. So here we go. Let's get into this um, with number 25, the diary in the journal of David Brainerd. Now, I have just recently assigned this book as part of the requirements for my class that I'm teaching at RPTS, the Reformed Presbyterian Theological Seminary, because the journal and diary of David Brainerd is one of the most important books that inspires world missions. In fact, <clears throat> David Brainerd was a colleague of Jonathan Edwards. He actually died in Edwards' house. Interesting story. Probably fell in love with Edwards' daughter. I'm not sure if you knew that or not. Um, but nevertheless, Brainerd was a bold, courageous, and faithful missionary to the Native American peoples. And he died of tuberculosis at a very young age. And this is the journal of all of his sufferings and all of his prayers for the glory of Christ and for his kingdom. Now, before we get too far into this video, let me just remind you that you can find this entire list of 100 books. If you go to my YouTube channel and you know where to find that because you're already here and click on this 10 more links and then scroll past the boring stuff about me, go all the way down to this sheet right here of 100 best books and you can find the whole list. I've got links to videos that I've done on them and links to where you can buy them on Amazon. All right, let's get back to the list here. Number 24 is volume two of the works of Jonathan Edwards. Now, I wanted to put on all 26 volumes of Edwards' works, but alas, I didn't think anyone would watch those videos as much as I love Edwards. But volume two is one of the best. It is his book, The Religious Affections. And this is where a mature Jonathan Edwards works through the nature of conversion. What does it mean to be converted? After the revivals came through and passed, Edwards wanted to think about why some of the would-be converts seem to have persisted in the faith and others seem to have fallen away. And so he looks deeply into the nature of true conversion. And here he says that conversion is a, a change of the very affections, the very internal heart of the person, him or herself. Wonderful book, very devotional. You'll probably love it. Number 23, The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Now, I I don't think that Bonhoeffer is entirely reliable in everything that he says. Of course, he's Lutheran and I'm Presbyterian, so you'd expect a little bit of disagreement there. There is a couple of things that are just a little bit off in his orthodoxy, nevertheless. Okay, Bonhoeffer is, was an incredible saint, true Christian in my view, converted. Um, he was... He doing ministry during the time of Adolf Hitler. In fact, he led an underground training seminary undermining the Third Reich and Hitler's regime. And the cost of discipleship is his, well, probably his magnum opus about how difficult it is to be a Christian. He talks about um, when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. One of his favorite, my favorite lines of his. And many other sayings related to the Sermon on the Mount, the teachings of Jesus, particularly as Christ bids us to come and give up absolutely everything to follow after him. Cost of Discipleship, great book. 22, A Defense of Calvinism by Charles Spurgeon. Now, this is more of a tract or a booklet, but I do refer people to it quite a bit because whenever people get bad apprehensions about what Calvinism is, they often don't even realize that Charles Spurgeon, someone that they love, was a Calvinist. And this was his short little book, Defending the Essence of Calvinism. In other words, a strong emphasis on the gospel, of course, but also a very strong understanding and theology of the sovereignty of God over all things, including election and atonement. A wonderful little book, definitely worth your read. Number 21, one of my top dystopias, 1984. This book is basically coming true <laughs> today as we look at the authoritarianism of our growing uh, increasingly powerful centralized governments, subsuming all of the other things of the state, uh, crushing other worldviews, uh, crushing what it believes to be wrong think. I've done a couple of videos on this book. It's a really great fictional book, but it's also a little bit scary in terms of its realism today, unfortunately. Number 20, Desiring God by John Piper. I hope you like John Piper as much as I do. I realize there's some things that we may disagree with. 
uh, he being Baptist, me being Presbyterian, but man, was this book very, very helpful to me. Desiring God, Meditations of a Christian Hedonist. If you think of hedonism as one who pursues pleasure from the world, Piper's view of Christian hedonism is that we derive our ultimate pleasure from the pursuit and experience of the presence of God. And then he takes that principle and he applies it to several basic categories of, of Christian life, including finances, missions, family life, things like that. One of the best devotional reads. Really appreciated this book, especially when I was a younger man. Number 19, Christianity and Liberalism by J. Gresham Machen. Yes, the great Presbyterian forefather of the OPC, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Highly influential for us PCA folks as well. Christianity and Liberalism is where uh, Machen suggests that there is no such thing really as liberal Christianity, but that liberalism and Christianity are two completely different religions. And I totally agree with him on that point. It's a wonderful book, number 19. Number 18, The Bondage of the Will by Martin Luther. This is probably my highest ranked book of Luther, I believe, unless I surprise myself in my own list. I should know it (laughs) because I looked at it before hitting record. But The Bondage of the Will is where Luther sounds like a Calvinist. He really does. He talks about the depravity of human nature, He talks about the absolute necessity of saving grace in the Christian's life. Um, He talks about the law. He talks about the gospel. This is a powerful book in which Luther shuts down every other possible route to salvation except God's saving grace through faith in Jesus Christ. A wonderful book. It's an argument against uh, his interlocutor, Erasmus. Number 18, Bondage of the Will. Now, 17, just changed names on me. I put this on my top 20 list, another John Piper book. 21 Servants of Sovereign Joy is what it used to be called. My friend Mitch just gave me a new copy of this book. It's changed names. It's like 26 servants or 28 or something like that now. But the number of servants of sovereign joy has increased. These are so delightful. Listen to me. This is a delightful book. These are short biographical sketches that Piper preached at some of his conferences. But man, they're so powerful, so rich, so wonderfully written. Piper gets straight to the heart of each one of these persons. Uh, Short biographies of men like Tyndale and Luther and Augustine and John Patton and so many others. Jonathan Edwards is now in the new one. Love this book. Hearty, wonderful, warm, motivating biographical sketches from John Piper. I just like Christian biography and church history, so this book is great for me. 16, what a boring cover, right? Well, I I added the words just because the the real cover is blank. Works of Jonathan Edwards, volume 16, personal writings. Now, this is one that I used quite a bit in my dissertation as well as in my book on the resolutions of Edwards, and that's because this book contains all of Edwards' letters as well as his resolutions his diary, his personal narrative, and his apostrophe to Sarah Pierpont, his then, well, the woman that became his wife. All right, so this is a wonderful one. If you want to look at what Edwards wrote in his personal life, this is the one for you. Number 15, actually, let me go back to these. Let me remind you that all the works of Jonathan Edwards are free online at edwards.yale.edu. You can just download them and send them to your Kindle. That's what I do all the time. Just did it this morning. Number 15, the history of the Eberhardt family. Now, this is probably only interesting to me, but it's very interesting. In fact, this is a, uh, a story of my family, the Eberhards. used to be called Eberhards with a D and a T. Uh, now we're Everhard. There are still some Eberhards roaming around out there, but we changed the name, Americanized it a little bit when we came over here. Uriah Everhard was a pastor and an itinerant evangelist. And when he retired, the family, my family, we sent him back to Germany to go do the research of our annals and our history. And when he came back, he wrote an incredible story tracing our family line all the way from 1265 uh, all the way up through 1727 when we came over on the on the boat Friendship and uh, came into the port of Philadelphia. And we began to immigrate uh, across uh Pennsylvania and into Ohio, where we stopped around the Wadsworth area. That's where all my folks are from. It's an amazing story, and uh, it's probably not interesting to you, but it's really a really a great story of our family. Number 14, Matthew Henry's Commentaries. Got to have this one on the list, right? Um, I think probably every pastor, every pastor worth his salt, has probably benefited from Matthew Henry's Commentaries some at some point. They're so rich. They're so deep, they're so profound, they're so reformed in their theology. 
Don't forget, Matthew Henry was a reformed Calvinistic Presbyterian. Some people don't know that. You know, the abridged versions of Matthew Henry, somebody, some malevolent worker out there, went in and cut out all the Calvinism <laughs> out of Matthew Henry's commentary. So you gotta be you got to watch out for the abridged versions because a lot of them have been sanitized of their reformed theology and just made more generically evangelical. But uh, the good stuff is right here. Hendrickson publishes a nice, handsome edition of them, but they're so proliferous online, you can just get them for free practically anywhere. Make sure to check out Matthew Henry's commentary. If you're preaching or teaching, you'll probably get some neat insight that you can put into your sermons. You'll want to cite him, of course. Otherwise, you'll be a plagiarist, but Matthew Henry will lead you in the right direction for the most part. Number 13, we're getting down to it now, the Heidelberg Catechism. Now, as Presbyterians, obviously, we subscribe to the Westminster Confession of Faith. We have our own catechisms. In fact, we've got two, the larger and the shorter but the Heidelberg Catechism also comes from the Reformed tradition. And what I love about this one is that the questions and the answers in the Heidelberg are personalized. So, for instance, rather than just merely talking theory about justification or grace or saving faith or things like that, the Heidelberg Catechism famously points these questions right at the individual and says, what is your comfort in life and in death? My greatest comfort in life and in death is, and then it gives the answer, so it's very personalized. Also works on the threefold premise of guilt, grace, and gratitude, which is a wonderful way to construct Reformed theology. Some of us Presbyterians, we wish the Heidelberg Catechism is ours, um, but the three forms of unity are still wonderful, still beneficial to a lot of us. Number 12, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners by John Bunyan. Bunyan might pop up on the list again, and we'll have to see here in just a few moments, but this is his autobiography as he tells his agonizing story of his own conversion. He goes through all of this tremendous um, convulsions of his soul, the perturbations of his heart, his fears, anxieties, his struggles with blasphemy and demonic thoughts, all the way to the point in which he is profoundly and richly converted and God use him, uses him marvelously as a writer and as a local church pastor, often experiencing prison and hardship, suffering for Jesus, one of the best Christian autobiographies ever written, for sure. Number 11, how about the Trinity hymnal, right? We've got to get some music on this list. Here's mine right here. Can't see it. There we go, other side. Trinity hymnal, um, time-tested, used in PCA and OPC churches. Um, some of the best hymns ever written, all fully vetted for their theology with some catechetical instruction in the back as well. Very helpful book. I love it. Number 10, Sermons of Jonathan Edwards. This is the first thing that I ever read from Edwards. It's actually a collection of his more famous sermons. It's not technically part of the official works of Jonathan Edwards, the Yale editions, but this has been culled from various of his previous publications and put together in one hardback form, printed off, published by Hendrickson, our friends there. I love this book. It's so good. These are really, honestly, some of the best sermons of Jonathan Edwards. If you don't want to mess around with the official works of Edwards by Yale, grab this one in hardback and read to your heart's delight. Edwards' sermon's awesome. Number nine, A Body of Divinity by Thomas Watson. I've often said that if I wasn't an Edwards scholar, I might switch over and become a Thomas Watson scholar. He's such a wonderful, quotable, eminently rich divine. Somebody asked on Twitter the other day, who would be a Presbyterian counterpart to Charles Spurgeon? I commented, I think Thomas Watson could be that. Spurgeon is known for his wittiness, his quotableness, just the insightful ways that he states beautiful doctrine. Watson is exactly the same. When I read some quotes and passages from Watson, um, I almost think I'm reading Spurgeon. So if you like Spurgeon, you'll probably like Watson. Watson, not quite as funny as Spurgeon is, but nevertheless, just amazing stuff. He's got three books that you should be aware of. A Body of Divinity. He's got a commentary on the Ten Commandments and then another commentary on the Lord's Prayer. Those would be the three main works of Thomas Watson. You'll love every single page, I promise you. We're in the top ten now. Can you believe it? Number eight, Morning and Evening by Charles Spurgeon. One of the best devotions. I've talked about this book many times on my channel. In fact, all of the top 10 are probably going to be things I've talked about before. Morning and evening has two devotions for every day of the calendar year. So January 1st or whatever day you're on has two devotions, a morning devotion and an evening devotion. Each one is Spurgeon's extrapolation of one particular verse of the Bible. They are perfect for personal devotion or use in family devotions. You can use them on mission trips multi-purpose. Sometimes I even take notes on them and put them in my wide margin Bible because the way he just 
the way he elucidates scripture is so beautiful and rich and helpful. I love pretty much any devotion is a masterpiece, and there's hundreds of them in this particular book. Number seven, Chronicles of Narnia. True story. Last night, got my teenage girls. We're sitting on the couch together. I'm reading The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe out loud to them. I'm doing every voice to the best I'm able to do them. We get to the chapter on the stone table, and I can hardly even hold it together. I'm trying to just not cry because the book is so amazing. One of my daughters commented that she she just felt it deep inside her as we were reading the story of the death and resurrection of Aslan. Obviously, a typological description of the cross, uh, looking to Jesus Christ. Aslan is the Christological figure in the book. These stories are just so amazing. Guys, if you're not reading them yourselves and not reading them to your children, I don't know what you're doing. These books are amazing. I love them so much. You know, it's funny. I'll just go on for one second here. Every time I tell my girls, hey, let's read tonight. I'll read you some some of the book. They always kick up a fuss because they want to do something else, do something more mature. They're in high school. And then once I start reading, I watch my 17-year-old and my 14-year-old just melt like putty because they love these stories and I do too. Got to read these ones. Number six, here we go. We're coming up to the top five almost. John Calvin's commentaries. Now, again, you can find this for free online in all kinds of places, but man, Calvin's commentaries are just some of the best. He comments on almost every single book of the Bible. There's a few he didn't do. He didn't do some of the stuff in Kings and Chronicles and Samuel. He didn't do Revelation. Unfortunately, he didn't do Ecclesiastes, but almost every other of the book book of the Bible is is thoroughly thoroughly um, exposited by John Calvin, one of the one of the premier reformed theologians of the Reformation era. Number five, the works of Jonathan Edwards, Volume Four, The Great Awakening. Now, this is probably my favorite volume. I really really do love this one. This one gives you three of his most important works. You get a faithful narrative, which is the story of the local 1735 revival. You get distinguishing marks of the work of the Spirit, which I love, and I refer to that all the time. And then finally, you get a larger treatise, Some Thoughts on the Revival. What a boring name of a book, Some Thoughts on the Revival. But that's Edwards' description of the strengths and the weaknesses of the Great Awakening. Okay, here we go. Top four, The Confessions of St. Augustine. By the way, can you guess what hasn't been mentioned in this list so far? Are there books that you're wondering when I'm going to mention them? And here we are in the top four, and I haven't said them yet. Well, maybe they're coming up right now. St. Augustine's Confessions is the definitive spiritual autobiography. In fact, it practically invented the genre of the autobiography, even the spiritual biography. This tells of Augustine's deep longings in his heart and his soul for meaning. He confesses very freely his wickedness, his sin, his fornication, his theft, his lust, his idolatries of various kinds, and it's written as a prayer to the Lord. So the whole book comes across as a prayer all the way up to the point of his conversion. Of course, his mother Monica is praying him to Christ, essentially. And then there's some really interesting stuff about time towards the end of the autobiography. But this is one of the greatest Christian books of all time. And that leads us to number three, John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. Now, maybe we could have switched up these last two. I guess it depends on your perspective. Probably probably Augustine's Confessions had a broader and longer impact than Calvin's Institutes, but Calvin's Institutes is the definitive systematic theology of the Reformation. You know, Luther, as bold and gregarious and lovable or hateable as he was, did not have time to write a systematic theology. And so John Calvin comes right along the same lane as Luther. Of course, they disagree on a few things, including the Lord's Supper, although they tried to gain some agreement there. Calvin comes across just a little bit later, and he's the first one to fully systematize the Protestant doctrine in what we would call today a systematic theology. One book, four books actually inside it, book one, book two, book three, book four, and Calvin takes you through all the major heads of Christian doctrine. All right, one of the best ever written. Number two, the Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechisms. Can you believe it? We haven't even said it yet, except for by way of reference, but here we go. This is my number two. Now remember, this is my list. You can totally disagree with me. Maybe put uh, Luther or Calvin or Augustine ahead of this one. But for me, the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Catechisms is one of the most helpful books ever written by man. Now, we call these our subordinate standards because obviously 
Everything is subordinate to the Word of God. The Word of God is the only inspired, infallible, and inerrant book. But the Westminster Confession of Faith is our standards for doctrine and uh, practice. The catechism's eminently helpful. The confession, unbelievably wise in its definitions of systematic theology and biblical theology and other such term terminology. Okay, and then that, that leads me to number one. And before I say it. What is your guess? If you're going to make a comment here, what would you say you think my number one book is going to be? Maybe you thought this would have been it right here. But here we go. Number one, are you ready? Do you know it? I haven't said it yet. Here we go. Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. It's just my favorite book. I can pick it up at any point. I can read any chapter, any paragraph, and Bunyan strikes right to the heart. If you're not familiar, this is an allegorical story in which a hypothetical Christian called Christian or the Pilgrim, he traverses on a journey from the city of destruction all the way to the gates of heaven itself. Along the way, he faces all kinds of trials, persecutions, difficulties, demonic oppression, battles with guilt and conscience. Along the way, he also meets some friends, others who betray him as traitors. Um, He is disappointed at various times, even as some of his dear loved ones die. But all the while, Christ, the Lord God, um, and the power of the Holy Spirit sustains him on this journey. And it's an incredibly encouraging story of your pilgrimage and my pilgrimage too. And that's and that's what's so rich about this is that as we're watching Bunyan's character, Christian, suffer as he goes through the valley of the shadow of death and Uh, He goes through all of these various journeys, uh, has to go through um, just so many different trials, temptations, near fatal encounters with oppressive demonic enemies, all these things. Yet the Lord sustains him by his, uh, his grace and his favor throughout. This is one of the most important books of all time. If you have not read uh, Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, please do so at your nearest convenience. All right? Well, that's it for me. I would love to hear your thoughts. I gave you my top 100. Don't forget the other three videos are already up on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for watching this. Please do let me know where I got it right or where I got it wrong. But in the meantime, know this. I love you lots, and we'll talk to you later.